All over the BBC, in storerooms, corridors and cupboards, lie the remains of the BBC's production process. Computers are widespread, but there's no standard way of logging original material and no central database of logs. Processes have become inefficient and hundreds of thousands of hours of unique footage remain unexploited. We literally don't know what we're throwing away. Every year, the BBC generates over 100,000 hours of new material. With a commitment to reducing costs and serving new platforms, storing and manipulating that amount of footage is an increasing problem for programme makers. But a system will soon exist where all the problems and inefficiencies could be solved and deliver huge benefits to the BBC. <laughs> Once a programme has been commissioned and a team set up, initial research begins. Even for specially shot programmes, this often involves a library search. Use of archive material may reduce the need for expensive location shoots or reduce the amount of time spent on location. When shooting's completed and all the archive material found, the film or tape will be transferred and logged. Editing takes place on computer-based systems like Avid, so footage from the tapes is transferred into the Avid. After several weeks, this offline edit is complete, and once all the editorial decisions are agreed, an online edit will finish the programme ready for transmission. The post-production paperwork is then prepared, and the programme as completed, or PSC form, is created. It details the source and copyright of all the material used in the programme. Finally, the material will be passed to the library for storage and cataloguing. Sounds straightforward? Well, every year millions of pounds are wasted across the BBC by problems and inefficiencies throughout the production cycle. I've worked here in production for about 10 years and things are changing all the time, changing really fast. Loads of new platforms, new opportunities, which is great, but at the same time, our turnaround um, times are getting shorter and shorter, our budgets are coming down all the time, um, and we're still essentially doing things exactly as we've done for years and years. So that causes huge problems now, um, right from the start of the process, right from initial research. <laughs> Much of the early research on a production is done through the BBC library system, Infax. It's a vast store of information that provides the main source of details on archive footage. Infax is a very powerful system, but it's, it's quite an old system and it, uh, it can take quite a lot of time to actually find um, the specific shot you want and even then you only get a written description. So uh, you've got to actually go and physically get the tape. Uh, view it to find out later that that shot that you, uh, you saw the written description of is no good, back to square one. So it has its uses, but uh, it would be much more useful to actually stay at the desk and complete everything at the desk and view the image at the desk. Infax doesn't give accurate copyright information, so if you want to reuse a shot, you have to check the PSC. But many of these don't state clearly which shots belong to the BBC and which ones are bought in. This can result in costly mistakes or leave much of the archive unexploited. And Infax only catalogues material within the library system. It doesn't deal with rushes. At the moment, we don't really have a standardised logging system which works across the unit. Different productions have different needs because of the nature of their programmes. At the moment, it's kind of word of mouth. Oh, I remember shooting a sequence, you know, on this creature or that creature. Didn't make it to the film, but it's really good. It might be useful for your programme. And it's just sort of, you know, good fortune if you happen to speak to the producer that did that. It's not always easy to find the shot you want. I don't know how they are logged across the BBC. I mean, I know some people, I've, I've wanted crocodile footage and... Um, I've been to see people and they just hand me a book where they've handwritten in logs, <laughs> rushes, you know. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. And that means that searching for just the right shot can extend into the offline edit itself. 
You're just thrown tapes and told to go look for a shot of so-and-so, which can be very time-consuming. You know, you've got to spin through a 30-minute tape just looking for one animal doing one bit of activity. They know it's on there somewhere, but they don't know where it is. The Bristol Natural History Unit, or NHU, uses a high proportion of library material. Low-cost series, like The Really Wild Show, rely heavily on the archive to enhance its subject range. It's got ingredients from lots of different animals. Its body and silky fur are very much like a mole. Shots for this sequence were taken from four different sources. But like a beaver, our creature has a large flat tail. Planet Earth is home to thousands. Wild Vision, the NHU's commercial arm, generates entire series of 50-minute programs solely from library footage. And uncover creatures that look like extras from a sci-fi movie. The majority of shows I've worked on have been entirely archive-based shows, so obviously a big reliance on, on infax to find the shots we need. Um, you will find that a lot of your time is, at the beginning of the production, is finding uh, a huge search to find a uh, majority of shots you need. When you get closer to the edit itself, then you're firefighting and finding specific shots, and you can spend a half a day trying to find one shot or find one tape that you know one shot is on and you can never find the damn tape because someone else has got it in an edit, isn't owning up to having that tape, you're lost. You have to go back to square one and find an alternative, even though that one is probably the best. Probably a rather too much time is invested in chasing tapes and searching tapes um, that could be put into the more creative end product. A lot of shows are fast turnaround and due to the specialist nature of the footage involved, Unlike some regional centres, the NHU stores most of its archive material on site. There's around 28,000 hours of footage here, and many of the tapes are in constant use. Over 2,000 are issued every month. So, despite expensive accommodation costs, on-site storage is the only option. 50-minute archive programme we recently made for Discovery Channel, we had over 300 source tapes and 300 beta tapes from the dispatch library here all being shared by various productions is um, a nightmare really I think is the only word you can describe it because you are you are running around all the time you become your own library because you hold all these tapes in your office for an edit or in the edit suite itself and you have to set up your own library system because people will be borrowing those tapes you, you want to know where they've gone in the building you've got to go and get them back where I work in Wild Vision, we often make non-natural history programmes for people like Discovery Channel. Um, this would involve getting non-natural history footage, so ordering tapes up from London. Um, in theory, we should be able to get the tapes within 24 hours. However, if the tape's lost or someone else has the tape out, we then have to wait a couple more days before we can get the tape from London. Uh, then when the tape from London finally arrives, you can spend half a day spooling through it only to find that the shot you want is not on the tape that you have. So you end up sending the tape back to London and you're back to square one. Every week, thousands of tapes are moved up and down the country. It's an expensive and time-consuming business. Most tapes are loaned to productions for two weeks. After that, a fine of £50 is levied. Of the 355,000 tapes loaned by London in 1999, one third had overdue notices served on them and 11,500 were never returned at all. Every production will lose tapes. If it's big, it will lose tapes. If it's used a lot of archive material, certain tapes will just disappear. I've actually lost tapes, and I don't know why I've lost them. They've just disappeared. It's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, isn't it? There's a planet somewhere where they all go. Sometimes unique footage is lost forever. This raw material represents the sum total of a programme budget, often millions of pounds. Unfortunately, it can't always be treated with the respect it deserves. Often when we're using archive tapes, um, which, which can be master tapes, they might be the only copy of a programme, um, they get chucked in bags, they get dumped in boxes, left in corridors, bust all over the BBC. Um, when they're viewed, we fast forward through them repeatedly or, or go backwards and forwards through them looking for shots. Um, they get ejected without being rewound. All of that means you get dropout, you get tape damage, and they can even break. You can even lose master material. 
Well, what we're sort of finding is two things. One, that people are replaying the same tape over and over again. And in the case of the mini tapes, we're actually getting some breakages now. People aren't treating the tapes properly. So by the time it's been logged, it's maybe been transferred, there might be an additional viewing within the offline, we're actually finding that some of these tapes are getting damaged. Due to the constraints on program budgets, people are now using their master tapes in these areas. They no longer got the money to make copies. And that's leading to real problems, because if your master tape snaps, you're in real trouble. <laughs> For the NHU, film is still the most suitable acquisition format for most of its location work. We're actually forced to carry every tape machine imaginable. We're probably spending between 100 and 150,000 pounds per year, either investing in new formats or actually replacing existing formats that have worn out. At present, machinery is a big issue for me because there are so many formats. It's getting the right machine in the right place at the right time. When we don't have enough equipment, which is quite often, especially during the peak period in autumn, we have to hire in machines. So it can be quite a problem and it's also an expense it's it's BBC money going straight out the door we also do um, a lot of machine room transfers that that's part of the business has grown and grown and grown we have an extensive machine room out there where we can do any broadcast format to any broadcast format I would say we probably get through in the order of 50 hours a day of um, machine room transfers and as I say that's on the increase as well very often when we're ordering tapes, um, there might be a D3 or a Digi or, or some format that's not easy for us to get into our Avids, we'll have to transfer them onto Beta SP and then digitise them into our systems. Um, very often the next day another production will approach you because they want to borrow that tape too, they'll take it away and they'll transfer it and then they'll digitise it. Um, and this happens again and again. So you're getting the same tape being re-transferred, re-digitised over and over again. And so that's got to be a waste of time and money. Every year, the BBC spends in excess of eight and a half million pounds on tape preparation and transfer. Transferring archive clips and specially shot material is one step towards preparing material for the edit. The next is media logging. A great deal of time and effort is poured into carefully noting all the shots required for a particular programme but virtually none of that information is retained beyond this stage of the process. The media log produces a list of shots so that material on the tapes can be transferred into computer editing systems such as Avid. This process is known as digitising. There are some key shots, some key pieces of material, um, key areas that are constantly revisited um, and retreated and we must be redigitising those within individual productions many, many times, um, which doesn't seem cost-effective, labour-effective, or creatively very effective. The entire post-production system relies on time data, or time code as it's more commonly called. Time code is a means of identifying any particular frame on any particular tape. It gives you a unique address. So if someone says, I need a shot that is at 9 minutes 25 seconds and three frames in, you can immediately go to it, find the exact frame they're talking about. The present system only works efficiently if the time data remains 100% accurate throughout the production process. But that's not always the case. If the system fails, it can fail in several ways. Um, you can get repeat time codes on the same tape. DVs are very prone to that. You turn the camera off, you start again, it go, resets to zero, so you end up with 
lots of sets of the same time code on the same tape. And any errors not discovered or resolved now pass on to the next stage of editing, the autoconform. Added to this, all the tapes used in the offline have to be recalled. One spends a lot of time trying to get tapes together for a conform. Um, often if different people are using the same tapes for different programmes, you spend a lot of time chasing different tapes that different people want for conforms. And those timecode errors and missing tapes can combine to create a double whammy that turns the auto-conform into anything but an automatic process. Every single conform has something that goes wrong. Now, there might be something very minor so that it, it's easily smoothed out, and it might just be a phone call that solves a problem, but um, to get through a conform with absolutely no hitches whatsoever would be... Um, a minor miracle, I think. <laughs> and that's just the pictures. Similar problems occur with sound. Hogging in the window, there was a real. <laughs> it's custom and practice for the sound and vision to be online separately. But often, errors in either the broadcast sound or pictures are only apparent at the end of the process when the two are joined back together. And any faults discovered at this stage can be very costly to repair. I would estimate that we probably spend, or rather production spend with us, um, in wasted money close to £500 a day, uh, just at Bristol here. It could, it could be three hours of an edit suite where we're repairing an EDL, an edit decision list, with incorrect time data. And this could come from anywhere. It, it could have been generated in the AVID or uh, at the offline stage, possibly sometimes to conform, but more often than not at the, at the camera stage where incorrect time data is being generated within the actual camera. <laughs> The technology now exists to address many of the problems suffered by program makers every day across the BBC. Several projects have already piloted some aspects of asset management, but the system under development in Bristol does more than any other currently in use. It's a tool designed by program makers for program makers, and its ultimate aim is to remove tape from virtually all stages of the production cycle. Rushes and archive material will be digitised once and once only. Information will be captured upstream and retained throughout the production process and beyond. Production teams will be able to search and view material directly at their desktop. It will also be possible to log and edit the material within the system. Broadcast quality autoconforms, finishing and playout will be another function of the tool and all without the limitations or inherent problems of using the present tape-based operation. Storing and manipulating material in a new way will create huge cost benefits and help generate new revenue streams. It will also drive forward efficiencies by creating the ability to re-engineer the production process. You're cutting out so many middlemen and therefore you're making the system much, much more efficient. It would be much better if we could actually stay at our desk, do everything from the desk. And it would be lovely to be able to send things up to the controllers. I'm going to have to hire less machines in, and ultimately I'm going to have less machines, because I'm not going to need them. A lot of time is wasted here, between sites, picking things up. I'm going to need one machine in order to digitise everything into this central area, which will be accessible to everybody. I won't need to do it on a Tuesday and then find that somebody else needs the same material on a Wednesday because it will already be there. So that's going to save me time, it's going to save me money, and ultimately that's going to be passed on to production, so it'll save production time and money as well. If you can do it all at your desk, you'll save a hell of a lot more time. I think we have, um, as I said, hit the wire um, in terms of actually the efficiencies we can make in the field and in in the standard post-production procedures, yes. I think I, I really can't see how we can turn the programmes around any more efficiently. Um, and I think the only way forward is to look to new technology and to look to our own production techniques and methods um, as a way of being more efficient, being more efficient, but being just as effective. Mm -hmm.